What do Jesus Christ and Julius Caesar have in common? As crazy as it may sound, there's evidence that suggests that they may have been one and the same. Now, before you get offended or outraged over these implications, I should probably tell you that there's more. What if I were to suggest that the Gospels that we've come to associate with the life and teachings of Jesus are in fact a rewriting of Roman historical sources? It's a lot to swallow, I know. But if you're still watching at this point, you're doing great. Hang in there and try to stay calm just long enough for us to examine the evidence, at which point you can come to your own conclusion. Ladies and gentlemen, the man behind this controversial theory that was just introduced to you is Francesco Carota. An Italian-German scholar, Carota has spent years meticulously researching and building his case. He argues that the narrative of Jesus' life, his death, and resurrection parallel the events and circumstances of Julius Caesar's life with uncanny similarity. And it doesn't stop there. Carota further contends that Christianity itself evolved from the cult of the deified Caesar. Imagine that, the world's largest religion with over two billion followers stemming from the worship of a Roman ruler. Francesco Carota's theory is not a simple hypothesis, it's a labyrinth of connections and similarities between the life of Jesus Christ and Julius Caesar. It rests on the idea that the Gospels, the accounts of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, are a reworking of Roman historical sources, specifically the accounts of Julius Caesar's life and death. The parallels, according to Carata, are numerous. For instance, both Caesar and Christ were leaders who ushered in a new era. Caesar transformed Rome from a republic to an empire, while Christ's teachings led to the birth of Christianity. Furthermore, both were betrayed and killed, leading to significant upheaval. Caesar was assassinated in the Senate, while Christ was crucified after being handed over by one of his disciples. Their deaths, Carota suggests, are eerily similar. He also points out that Caesar's body was cremated, and a comet appeared in the sky, which was seen as a sign that he had become a god. Christ, on the other hand, was resurrected and ascended to heaven, becoming a divine figure in Christian belief. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 6, the angel tells Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, he is not here, for he is risen, as he said. This moment of resurrection is mirrored in the Roman historical account when a comet is seen in the sky after Caesar's cremation, signaling his divine status. Carata argues that these similarities are not mere coincidences, but suggest a deliberate rewriting of history. He believes that the Gospel writers may have used the accounts of Caesar's life as a template for creating the narrative of Jesus Christ. But why would they do this? Carata suggests that it was to create a new, peaceful version of the Roman Empire's brutal history. Jesus' message of love and forgiveness was a stark contrast to Caesar's rule by force. Another significant parallel Carata draws between Caesar and Christ is their posthumous deification. After Caesar's death, a comet appeared in the sky, leading Romans to believe he had become a god. Similarly, after Jesus' resurrection, he ascended to heaven, further solidifying his divine status in Christian belief. The parallels between Jesus Christ and Julius Caesar are uncanny, leading us to ponder whether this could be a mere coincidence or a deliberate rewriting of history. Carota didn't stop at the life of Jesus and Caesar. He expanded his theory to include the development of Christianity itself. Francesco Carota's expanded theory doesn't merely echo the parallels between the life of Jesus and Julius Caesar. It goes a step further, suggesting that the roots of Christianity itself sprouted from the cult of the deified Caesar. Carota's theory takes us back, all the way back to the rise of the Roman Empire. Julius Caesar, the larger-than-life figure, was worshipped as a god after his death. His cult, the cult of the deified Caesar, was widespread across the Roman Empire. It was from this cult, Carata suggests, that Christianity emerged not as a new religion, but as a transformation of the existing cult. A fascinating element of this theory is the role of language and translation. Carata points out that the Greek word for gospel translates to good news, which was the same phrase used to announce the victories of Caesar. He also highlights how the Latin phrase veni, vidi, vici, famously attributed to Caesar, bears a striking resemblance to the phrase I came, I saw, I believed, found in the Gospel of John. In 2008, 
Karata presented a lecture that further elaborated on his theory. He spoke about how the transformation of the Caesar cult into Christianity wasn't a sudden shift, but a gradual process. Over time, the stories, rituals, and symbols of the cult were reshaped and reinterpreted to form the Christian narrative as we know it today. Karata's subsequent article outlines this transformation. In it, he discusses how the Roman practice of deification, where an emperor was declared a god after his death, was mirrored in the Christian belief of Jesus' resurrection and ascension. He also explores the similarities between the worship of Caesar and the veneration of Jesus, from the use of coins and statues to the incorporation of Caesar's comet into Christian iconography as the Star of Bethlehem. Karata's expanded theory paints a picture of Christianity not as a separate entity, but as an evolution of the Caesar cult. It suggests that the stories we know from the Gospels were not original narratives, but adaptations of Roman historical events and rituals. Yet it's important to remember that this theory is just that, a theory. It's a perspective that challenges the traditional understanding of Christian origins, stirring up questions and debates. The theory is expansive, but is it compelling? It's a question that can't be answered definitively. It depends on how one interprets the evidence, how one views the parallels and similarities, and ultimately, how one chooses to understand the origins of Christianity. And that's a journey each of us must embark on ourselves. Evidence is the backbone of any theory. So what does Karata bring to the table? Let's examine the archaeological, historical, theological, and non-biblical sources Karata employs to give credence to his theory. For starters, he points to the striking parallels between the lives of Julius Caesar and Jesus Christ. Just think about it. Julius Caesar was a military messiah who brought peace and unity to Rome, much like Jesus is seen as the spiritual messiah who brought peace and unity to humanity. Karata also draws attention to the transformation of the Roman Republic into the Roman Empire under Caesar's rule, paralleling it with the transformation of Judaism into Christianity under Jesus. This, he argues, is no mere coincidence, but a rewriting of history. But Karata doesn't stop there. He also utilizes canonical scriptures to bolster his argument. Take, for instance, the Gospel of Mark, the earliest of the four Gospels. He suggests that the author of Mark used the Roman historical sources about Caesar as a template for the life of Jesus. Karata also turns to non-canonical scriptures such as the Gospel of Thomas, a collection of Jesus' sayings. He argues that many of these sayings are remarkably similar to the wisdom literature of the Roman era, suggesting a common source. Even more intriguing is Karata's exploration of archaeological evidence. He points to coinage from the era of Caesar, bearing inscriptions that mirror key phrases from the Gospels. For instance, coins minted during Caesar's reign bear the inscription, Divs Eve Lives, meaning Divine Julius. This, he argues, is eerily similar to the title Divine Jesus used in the New Testament. Karata also delves into the realm of theology, comparing the deification of Caesar to the worship of Jesus. He points out that both were considered sons of God, both performed miracles, and both were seen as bringers of a new age. But perhaps the most compelling piece of evidence Karata brings to the table is the striking similarity between the funeral of Caesar and the Passion of Christ. He argues that the sequence of events, the procession, the lamentation, the eulogy, and finally the apotheosis or ascension to heaven, is practically identical in both cases. The evidence Karata presents is indeed intriguing and lends a certain weight to his theory. However, it's important to remember that correlation does not imply causation. That is, just because two events or phenomena are similar, it doesn't necessarily mean one caused the other. Additionally, one could argue that the similarities between Caesar and Jesus are due to universal archetypes found in many cultures and religions, not necessarily because one is a copy of the other. The evidence is compelling, but is it conclusive? That's a question we'll try to answer as we continue our exploration of Karata's theory and its implications. But for now, Let's sit with the evidence and ponder the possibilities. If Karata's theory is true, it would have profound implications on Christianity. Indeed, 
This understatement would be akin to saying that the discovery of fire had a minor impact on human evolution. If Jesus Christ was based on the life of Julius Caesar, and the Gospels were a rewriting of Roman historical sources, then Christianity, as we know it, would be turned on its head. The foundation of Christian beliefs, rituals, and history would be shaken to the core. It would be like pulling the rug out from under two billion people who identify as Christians worldwide. Imagine the impact it would have on the way we perceive the Bible. The sacred text, revered and studied by millions, could now be seen as a historical rehash of Caesar's life, not a divine revelation. The stories of miracles, resurrection and ascension, would they still hold the same power? Or would they be viewed as creative adaptations of Roman accounts? Consider the rituals, the sacraments, the very core of Christian worship. The Eucharist, for example, believed to be a commemoration of Christ's Last Supper. Would it retain its sanctity if it were a reenactment of a Roman feast? And what about the cross, the quintessential symbol of Christianity? If it were derived from a Roman standard, would it still be revered? The implications extend beyond the realm of belief and ritual, reaching into the very fabric of history. The timeline of early Christianity would need to be reevaluated. The historical Jesus, the cornerstone of Christian history, would he be relegated to the pages of Roman history? And then there's the fallout. The potential for division, controversy, and even conflict within the Christian community is immense. The debate between traditionalists and those open to this new interpretation could be fierce, possibly even fractious. The implications are far-reaching, but are they plausible? That, my friends, is the question we must now turn to. Every theory has its detractors. So what are the arguments against Karata's theory? Critics of Karata's theory argue that it is largely based on a series of coincidences rather than on concrete evidence. They point out that similarities between the life of Julius Caesar and the narrative of Jesus Christ do not necessarily mean that one was based on the other. They argue that these similarities could simply be the result of common tropes in storytelling. One of the main counter-arguments comes from the field of textual criticism. Scholars in this field point out that the Gospels and the historical accounts of Caesar's life were written in different languages, Greek and Latin, respectively. They argue that the similarities Carota points out are the result of his translations and may not exist in the original texts. Another counterpoint comes from historians who argue that Carota's theory ignores the historical and cultural context of the Gospels. They point out that the Gospels were written in a Jewish context and reflect Jewish beliefs and customs. On the other hand, Julius Caesar lived in a completely different time and culture. Critics argue that it is unlikely that a Jewish religious text would be based on the life of a Roman emperor. Critics also challenge Carota's claim that Christianity developed from the cult of the deified Caesar. They argue that there is no historical evidence to support this claim. They point out that the cult of Caesar was a political institution, while Christianity was a religious movement. They also argue that the cult of Caesar did not have a significant influence in the areas where Christianity first developed. Theologians also present counter-arguments based on the teachings of Jesus Christ. They argue that Jesus' teachings were radically different from the political and military actions of Julius Caesar. They point out that Jesus preached love and forgiveness while Caesar was a military leader known for his conquests. Critics also point to the lack of archaeological evidence to support Carota's theory. They argue that if the Gospels were a rewriting of Roman historical sources, there would be archaeological evidence to support this. However, no such evidence has been found. Lastly, critics argue that Carota's theory requires a large-scale conspiracy to rewrite history. They point out that such a conspiracy would be nearly impossible to carry out without leaving any trace of evidence. The counter-arguments are strong, but do they debunk Carota's theory? This question remains open to interpretation and further exploration. After weighing the evidence and counter-arguments, where does that leave us? Let's recap the evidence. The parallels between the life of Julius Caesar and the narrative of Jesus Christ, the similarities in their public image, and the striking resemblance in their post-death deification. 
We've dived into quotes from both canonical and non-canonical scriptures, and examined archaeological and historical sources supporting this theory. On the other side of the coin, we've scrutinized these theories, presenting compelling counter-arguments. We've questioned the validity of the sources, the context of the scripture quotes, and the potential for these similarities to be mere coincidences. We've also addressed the implications these theories could have on Christianity, should they hold true. So where does this leave us? In the realm of theories, this one certainly holds its weight. The evidence, while circumstantial, is compelling. The parallels between the lives of Caesar and Christ are striking. The similarities in their public image and their post-death deification cannot be ignored. However, the theory does have notable weaknesses. The reliance on circumstantial evidence, the lack of direct historical records linking Jesus to Caesar, and the potential for confirmation bias in interpreting the evidence, all weaken the foundation of the theory. Furthermore, the counter-arguments present their own compelling case. Many of the parallels between Caesar and Christ could be attributed to common themes in the lives of influential leaders and saviors. The lack of direct evidence linking Jesus to Caesar and the significant differences in their lives and teachings cast doubt on the theory. The idea that Christianity could have developed from the cult of the deified Caesar is also contentious. While it's certainly possible, it's also a significant leap that would require more concrete evidence to fully support. So, the verdict? It's not as clear-cut as we might have hoped. The theory that Jesus Christ was based on Tiberius Drusus Caesar Augustus is certainly intriguing. It presents a fresh perspective on the origins of Christianity and challenges our understanding of historical narratives. However, it also raises more questions than it answers. In the end, whether you find the theory compelling or not, it undoubtedly sparks a fascinating conversation about the nature of history the development of religion, and the power of narratives. Regardless of where you stand on Karada's theory, it has certainly made an impact. The audacious proposition that Jesus Christ was based on Tiberius Drusus Caesar, as presented by Francesco Carrada, has sparked a blaze of debate, controversy, and intrigue since its inception. It has in essence turned the world of religious studies on its head, leading many to question long-held beliefs and others to delve deeper into the historical connections between Rome and Christianity. This theory has also ignited a whirlwind of scholarly debate. Some scholars laud Carota's meticulous research and his boldness in challenging traditional narratives. They point to the striking parallels between the lives of Caesar and Christ, the similarities in their stories, and the undeniable influence of Roman culture on early Christianity. They argue that Carota's theory sheds new light on the origins of Christianity and prompts a re-evaluation of historical sources. On the other side of the coin, there are those who vehemently oppose Carota's theory. They accuse him of cherry-picking his evidence, oversimplifying complex historical events, and stretching the bounds of credibility. They argue that the similarities between Caesar and Christ are superficial at best, and that Carota's theory lacks the solid grounding required to overturn centuries of accepted belief. Yet, what cannot be denied is the public fascination with Carota's theory. It has captured the imagination of many, leading to a surge in interest in the historical roots of Christianity and the possible connections to Roman history. It has sparked discussions, debates, and even arguments in households, classrooms, and online forums around the world. Carota's theory has also been an important catalyst in encouraging further research into the origins of Christianity, prompting scholars to dig deeper, to question more, and to reassess accepted narratives. It has pushed the boundaries of religious studies, encouraging a more critical and open-minded approach. Whether you believe it or not, Carota's theory has certainly left its mark on the world of religious studies. It has stirred the pot, challenged the status quo, and opened up new avenues of exploration and understanding. And at the end of the day, isn't that what true scholarship is all about?